at this time. So I want you to take a look at the picture that is above me. I want you to take a really good look at the picture above me and then respond accordingly. How many of you see a beautiful young woman? Raise your hand. About half. How many of you see a slightly less attractive older woman? Raise your hands. Ooh, about half. Well, this famous illusion first appeared in 1888 on a postcard in Germany. It was made popular, however, by a British cartoonist by the name of William Eli Hill, who adapted the image and published it in a 1915 magazine under the title, My Wife and My (laughs) Mother-in-Law. Guys, that's a bold move right there. It was his last ever article. He hasn't been heard from since. (laughs) Now, I remember seeing that illusion as a kid back in elementary school. Images such as the old woman, young woman illusion operate by something that psychologists now call top-down processing. Top-down processing. That is, they play with our brain's innate ability to perceive size and relative depth and distance, as well as our memory's natural tendency to fill in certain gaps and patterns, oftentimes leading to ambiguous or conflicting interpretations of the information that we we're receiving. Now, with this in mind, I want you to once again take a look at the text of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And again, take a real good look at the text. And without raising your hand this time, I want you to respond in your heart to the following question. Do you see in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15 in particular, a harshly restrictive statement? Or perhaps do you see in that text a wonderfully descriptive statement? Do you see a large P prohibition, or do you see a positive promotion? Do you see the Word of God here as fundamentally holding women down, or as what I humbly and hopefully will show you this morning, do you see the Word of God lifting women up in the best and most righteous sort of way? to a place of dignity, to a place of beauty and importance and honor in God's spiritual family that is called the church. To be perfectly clear, I would not have preached this sermon on this day (laughs) if it were up to me. But God is way smarter than I am. These verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2 contain some of the most hotly disputed and most intensely debated words in the entire New Testament. In fact, certain pastors, even certain churches and denominations, upon seeing these words, have rushed immediately to one end of a theological and interpretive spectrum. On the one far end, we might call it the end of limit. Limit. For them, the portrait that they see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 9 to 15 is one that majors on the negative. They put the capital P in prohibition, particularly in verse 12, against women perhaps even at times daring to speak to a man in the church. Often these folks tend to focus almost exclusively upon what this passage says that a woman can't do rather than seeing perhaps more so, what she ought to do. At the same time, others see Paul's words here and run towards an altogether different conclusion, not limit, but what might be called liberty, a liberty interpretation of this text. For them, sometimes honestly and sometimes dishonestly, these folks see these verses and conclude that surely Paul 
didn't mean that. Surely Paul didn't mean to say what he appears to say there. Doesn't Paul say elsewhere in Galatians 3 verse 28 that there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. They allege that doesn't the gospel eliminate any and all distinctions between race and gender? Or perhaps they presume, wrongly I believe, that Paul was only talking to his particular time and place, to an ancient context in the city of Ephesus. That the word here does not apply to us, we are more enlightened now. This belongs to a primitive past. One text, two vastly different pictures. Brothers and sisters, listen to me very carefully this morning. Both of these extremes are utterly unhelpful. They are often abusive, and they can frequently lead to chaos or confusion in the church. This text is just as much the Word of God as John 3.16 is. We dare not dodge it. We dare not diminish it. Even if this text strikes us as hard to hear and maybe harder for some to receive, or as the illusion of the old woman, young woman does, it leads us to vastly differences of opinion. We still need to wrestle with this text. I want to ask you an altogether different question. Really the question that I think is on the heart of Paul as he pens these words. We we reframe by this question. What does real godliness look like in the local church for both men and women? I think that is what Paul is painting here. What does true godliness look like in the local church? And bear in mind, beloved, that this text, as we noted first last Sunday morning, in its context is all about rightly ordered, beautifully prioritized worship and relationships within the redeemed and reconciled community of men and women of Christ. The setting that Paul has in mind here for these specific instructions in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15, and even into chapter 3, is the public worship of the gathered church. The public worship of the gathered church. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 are really that key to the interpretation of the pastoral letters and specifically the letter of 1 Timothy. Paul says to Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Translation, Paul writes these words to show what God demands, even what God delights in and desires to see in his holy people. Now again, notice with me that immediately after Paul places a top priority on public prayer for God's saints in the gathered assembly, he concludes by saying regarding Christian men, verse 8 of 1 Timothy 2, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or without quarreling. That immediately next, Paul turns his attention to the sisters, to the women in worship and within the context of the gathered church, and writes, notice again, verse 9 and following, likewise, connecting back, likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness 
with self-control. Again, I ask you this morning, what is God's pattern, God's vision for loveliness and godliness, particularly for more than half of our congregation, the women in this church? To me, rather than being obtuse, rather than being ostensibly oppressive or even high-handed, the Apostle Paul and his words here in 1 Timothy 2.9 are actually meant to be read and received positively. To present a portrait of true beauty and humble behavior for our saved and sanctified sisters in the house of God. Here we discover under apostolic authority and deeply rooted into creation order, Four timeless and transcultural truths which elevate and promote rather than prohibit and downplay godly womanhood. Godly womanhood. First, we see here that a godly woman will clothe herself with the inner beauty of good works rather than seeking to draw attention to her outward beauty through extravagant or expensive dress. Secondly, We'll see here that a godly woman will commit herself to listening to and learning from the good words of Holy Scripture. Third, a godly woman will also conduct herself properly in God's house by honoring God's wise and good order of spiritual male leadership in the home and in the church. And finally, and fourthly, a godly woman will continue. She will persevere in faith by embracing her God-ordained responsibilities, which, generally speaking, may include childbearing. I think this is what Paul is trying to say here. Far from being harsh or oppressive, God's wise word to women, a timely word for Mother's Day, here in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15, sets a pathway for spiritual flourishing for half the church. In other words, the focus of this passage is not ultimately on a woman's outer appearance or on what a woman ought not to do in the church or even upon a woman's responsibility where God allows to have and bear children. But instead, the focus or the emphasis I hope you will finally see of this text is upon a godly woman's inner beauty her holy behavior in the household of God, her humble belief in the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, and her steadfast trust in God's eternal promises. This text shows us God's good pattern for godly womanhood in his church. I think we need to pray once more before we proceed. Let's pray. Father, again, you've been so good to me this week in preparing and laboring in the word to feed your family. Lord, I pray in a special way right now, you'd be so good to give grace to each heart to hear and to be quick to obey your truth. Lord, help us as we sort through and sift out what is the truth, what is proper use, and what is perhaps misuse of this passage, we ask in the name of Jesus, who is able and sufficient. Amen. So again, firstly, understand, I think very clearly in this passage, that a godly woman will, Paul says, clothe herself with the inner beauty of good works rather than seeking to draw attention to, or, uh, uh, to herself through outward beauty, extravagant or expensive, or perhaps even in that context, suggestive apparel. Paul had just instructed, remember, the men as Christ's followers, to be characterized by holiness and peace, by gentleness as they pray publicly. And so he pivots to the women in the congregation and says in verse 9 that they also should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or, per or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, that is, with good works. Paul has a word for the guys, and he has another word for the girls there in 
the gathered church. But what is his meaning? Commentator George Knight helpfully explains that just as Christian men needed in that time to be warned that their interest in vigor and discussion should not produce strife and dissension, so Christian women needed to be warned that their interest in beauty and adornment should not produce immodesty and indiscretion. That's a helpful word. I think he's exactly right. Listen, true godliness is concerned firstly about good works and the inner beauty of pursuing a heart that is after Christ. In fact, Paul's instructions here in 1 Timothy 2 are strikingly similar to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Look at that text with me. Peter says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectable and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, Peter writes, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I think that passage is helpful in understanding ours. If you hear, Or assume that Paul is more concerned with what's in a woman's closet than with what is in a woman's heart. You miss his point entirely. The Bible says, 1 Samuel 16, that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. But that doesn't mean that God necessarily prefers frumpiness over fashionableness. God has made a world full of of beautiful things. He loves beautiful things. Outward beauty isn't intrinsically evil. It's just not supposed to be ultimate. It's not supposed to be primary. True godliness runs from the inside out, not the outside in. Again, simply stated, and the point that I want us to take away from verses 9 and 10 in particular this morning is that a godly woman will not try to compete or co-opt Christ's attention in the church. We do not allure men's eyes away from their Savior looking at ourselves, ladies, by excessive or opulent or even suggestive dress, which must have been happening in ancient Ephesus. Why? Why won't we do that? Well, Paul will say because these godly sisters will be spending most of their time and much of their treasure on good works, not on gaudy dress. She'll be pursuing inner beauty, not chasing after outward attention. David Schrock notes here that modesty in this context is not so much a command for women to protect the eyes of their brothers. There are other Bible verses for that. Rather, the point here relates to the motives and intentions of her heart. That her motivation when adorning herself for church in the morning should be the glory of God, not to bolster her own self-worth through outward, outward apparel and dress. Listen, evidently in Ephesus, there were some new Christians, many of whom were women who came from well-to-do families that may have been connected to the temple worship of Artemis, that famed seventh wonder of the ancient world there in Ephesus. And in that context, high-class dress and expensive tastes were necessary for service in that pagan temple. If you didn't look the part, you couldn't serve in the church or in the temple, I should say. However, worship in Christ's temple, that is, in the church of Jesus, was to be vastly different. Here, the focus wasn't to be on fashion or expensive clothes, but rather it was to be upon a heart that was being fashioned after the image and character of Jesus Christ and his glory. Therefore, the portrait of a godly woman begins with the revelation that her heart is adorned with good works, not that her outer appearance is flashy or attractive. So I ask you, ladies, by way of application, 
is your focus when you ready yourself for worship upon impressing others by the way you look? Or is your focus on giving glory to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by adorning yourselves with godly works? Do you spend more time and money on external adornment than you do on developing the inner qualities and beauty of a heart after Jesus? I think that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Point number two is that a godly woman will also commit herself to listening to and learning from the good words of Holy Scripture. Let me give you a pop quiz. There's only one imperative in this entire passage. Where is it? Where is it found? Well, let me help you out. It's found in verse 11, and specifically in the phrase, let a woman learn. Let a woman learn. Now, admittedly, that phrase is modified with the statement, let a woman learn quietly and with all submissiveness. But listen, ironically, one of the most progressive and stunning statements in this entire passage is what we see in verse 11, where Paul says, let a woman learn. Let a woman learn. Therefore, our second principle flowing out of this passage right after Paul's wise words about women demonstrating good works in this statement is that a godly woman will likewise commit herself to listening to and learning from the word of God in Scripture. A godly woman flourishes in good works and she flourishes in the knowledge of Christ. She has a spiritual beauty And she has a sanctified brain. A sanctified brain. Beloved, women occupy, and this is not a question, I'm not asking anything, I'm making a declaration. Women occupy an important place in the gathered church. According to Paul, and in fact, contrary to conventional wisdom and cultural customs of his day, women are to be warmly welcomed in the community of learning disciples in God's house. They weren't relegated to the periphery. They were front and center in many ways. Sisters don't just sit in the stands in God's house. They are needed spiritually on the field of play. I can't improve upon what Chuck Swindoll himself says in his commentary and how he captures the positive advancement for godly womanhood and for their learning of Scripture. He says, and I quote, if you want to see real restrictions, then rewind the clock and travel back to Herod's temple in Jerusalem, but you have to get there before 70 AD when it was destroyed. He says, unlike Solomon's temple or the tabernacle that came before it, Herod's complex, that's King Herod's complex, featured two exclusive zones. A first wall restricted Gentiles, allowing only Jews and then Jewish converts to pass, but a second wall also restricted women from entering the place of worship, where only men could bring sacrifices and participate in the rites of worship. He says, similarly, synagogues in the first century featured a makitza, which is a partition separating the genders and restricted women from participation in worship services, except to be mere observers. These restrictions, however, did not come from Scripture. He concludes, you won't find them in the Old Testament. They were introduced later. Close quote. Unlike this strict, ethnic-based, gender-discriminating system of worship, learning from the word manthano, meaning to receive instruction or to learn, in Jesus' church is open to all. It is open to all. Far from diminishing the dignity and value of women, 1 Timothy chapter 2 actually elevates and promotes a portrait of godly womanhood and encourages, nay I say even commands, that women learn right alongside men in the church about the doctrines of Christ, the doctrines of grace, the word of God. But how should they go about it? How should they go about it? Verse 11 does in fact say, and we cannot eliminate what it says, that a woman must learn quietly with all submissiveness. But again, I ask, what does that mean? 
Well, it might be easier to start with what it doesn't mean. And let's be crystal clear about this. It does not mean complete silence. It does not mean complete silence. The ESV commentary, Expositor's Commentary series states, helpfully, quietly does not mean that women are never to utter a word when the church gathers for worship. That is an abuse and misuse of this text. Godliness does not equal silence in the service of saintly sisters. It doesn't. We could point to any number of passages, not to mention our own practices here at Trinity, to push against this misunderstanding of the Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and following. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 40. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And Titus 2, verses 3 through 5, just to name a few. The idea behind these words is, not, is that a woman being encouraged to learn the Bible should pursue such knowledge and learning without rancor. That is, without disruption. Women can and should, can and should, contribute to discussions in the church. They should ask questions in the church. They should be allowed to pray, even reading scripture at times in the church. However, the principle I believe that Paul is seeking to set forth here is that a godly woman will commit herself to learning the scriptures in the gathered church with a spirit of humility, of peaceableness, of godly honor to those teaching God's word instead of being argumentative and interfering with those whom God has charged with the responsibility of teaching the flock, namely the elders of the church. So ladies, again, by application, I ask you, are you eager to learn God's word? Or do you think, eh, that's my husband's job, that's the men's job, I don't need to learn the word of God. I'll never be called on to say anything in the church. No, that's a misunderstanding. Are you equally eager to peaceableness and, and a sense of serenity and calmness in the way that you learn? Or do you, do you participate in a disruptive fashion in classes and conversations? The bottom line is this. Do not let contemporary cultural baggage blur the beauty and the wisdom of God's good word, which encourages godly women to study the word of God, to study the scriptures just as much as anyone else in the church might do. This is proper, and it is beautiful, and it is necessary, and it is truly lovely to the Lord, ladies. Now next, thirdly, this morning, and here our ground certainly gets a bit more tricky, but a godly woman will also conduct herself properly in God's house by honoring God's wise, good order of spiritual male leadership in the home and in the church. Again, 1 Timothy 2.12 is without a doubt one of the most challenging and controversial verses in any of Paul's letters, if not the entire Bible. This verse is the reason why many see in this text a capital P prohibition on the role of women in the local church. And it's the reason why some view 1 Timothy 2 as an old hag rather than a beautiful young woman, if you get my meaning. But again, Paul's prior instruction to let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, as we stated already, is itself already a positive invitation, even a command, for Christian women to be afforded the same or similar opportunities for instruction, for growth, for service in good works as the men. However, there is here a wise and good order restriction. I'll call it even a boundary that a godly woman seeking to live out her calling as a Christian ought to respect, particularly in the local church. What is it? Well, let me read the pertinent verses, or did I say potent verses, and I'll unpack them under our third heading. 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Once again, that's not silent, but rather submissive and not argumentative. Verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. 
Beloved, the real difficulty of this text is not at all lost on me today. By God's grace to me to be able to winsomely and accurately teach you what this passage means and further God's grace to you to humbly and joyfully accept what God's word says here clearly will likely spell the difference between today's sermon being a bust or a blessing, between it being a heavy burden or a precious gift from our good and always gracious Father in heaven. Sisters, listen. I and your elders are sensitive to how this the, this verse in particular and how this passage in general has often been wielded as a weapon to wound rather than being used as a good word of instruction to lift you up. And we are sorry about that. Not to suggest in any way that we are guilty of that, but we are sorry of that in the broader context. It should not be used in that way. But there is a truth behind 1 Timothy 2, 12 that is counter-cultural. Paul tells us here that a godly woman will conduct herself properly and humbly in God's house, that is the church, by honoring God's wise order of spiritual male leadership in the home and particularly in the church. Consider that boundaries can be burdensome and can also be liberating. Boundaries can be burdensome when they are set too near and they are overly restrictive, and they can be also burdensome when they are set too far and are too permissive, or they can be beautiful when they are rightly framed and rightly set. Again, I believe that God has placed a fence around his yard, the church, allowing plenty of room for a godly woman to flourish in good works and in good words, but he put a fence there nonetheless, and it rightly restricts and protects something, but again, what is it? Well, friends, it is my opinion that good, good faith, godly, spirit-filled Bible teachers can honestly arrive at one of two hermeneutical conclusions while still holding to legitimate and sincere conviction commonly referred to today as complementarianism. I have to do a little vocabulary lesson today. Let me briefly give you two views of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, and then I want to stop briefly and set these views in a larger framework of four vastly different views on the relationship between men and women in the home and in the church. First, the two views, which again, personally, I know this is not without controversy, I believe can both fall acceptably and can also be abused, to be sure, under the concept of biblical complementarity. On the one hand, you can understand 1 Timothy 2.12 to teach a one-prohibition view. A one-prohibition view. That is, according to this understanding, the structure and syntax of this verse, Paul is ultimately prohibiting women from really one thing, just one thing in the church, namely teaching with authority. Teaching with authority. According to this view, broadly speaking, women can teach men, in the local church, so long as they don't teach with authority. That is, the pro prohibition that this particular group sees is upon a certain kind or quality of teaching, namely authoritative teaching, or perhaps they'd say this is Paul's shorthand way of saying the teaching that belongs to the elders. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 12 then pro prohibits one thing, women functioning as elders in the local church. That is their conclusion. Now the other view, the other interpretation of 1 Timothy 2, 12, which to be very clear is my view personally, and functionally it is our position here at Trinity, is what we would call rather a two-prohibition view. This understanding, which also is a true complementary position, complementarian position, the best sense of the grammar used by Paul leads us to believe that he is prohibiting women not from one thing, but from two things in the gathered church. Namely, from teaching men and from having or exercising authority over a man, again, in the church specifically. Now, certainly we believe, in fact, both camps or interpretive conclusions believe that Paul prohibits women from functioning as elders or pastors in the local church. But additionally, 
We believe, or I believe, and hopefully humbly and charitably so and graciously, that the best sense of this verse means that generally speaking, teaching in the local church when men are present ought to be done by the church's elders or by spiritually qualified men under the authority of the local church's elders. And it should not be done by the sisters or by the women. Let me pause for a moment of clarity. This view does not mean that Paul is prohibiting all kinds of teaching from all women entirely. It does not mean that. In fact, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 seem to have a thing to say about that. Titus, uh, Paul writes to Titus, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Further, likewise, women are clearly gifted by the Holy Spirit for teaching and commanded by the Lord to use their gifts and experiences in the building up of the body of Christ. But friends, Paul does put a fence up. What I believe is a beautiful boundary meant to foster rightly ordered flourishing and gospel freedom in the local church by saying that within the local gathering of the members of Christ's body, women are not to teach or to have authority over a man. Let me go back to Chuck Swindoll, who was so helpful this week. He says, and this is really helpful, guys. Listen, don't let me lose you yet. Bear in mind, churches in the first century didn't offer children Sunday school, women's classes, adult teaching outside of the corporate worship service, or the host of other programs that churches provide today. Paul's, Paul directed these words to women attending the public gathering for worship and instruction. And the responsibility for preaching there fell to male leaders, not to the women. Now hold tight to that idea. I'm going to return to it. I think it would be helpful to stop and to place these two views within a larger framework of four very, very different views in connection to the role of or relationship between men and women in the church or even in society for that matter. And I believe, again, there's good faith debate among complementarians on this particular question. First, the first view, radical feminism. Maybe you've heard that before, radical feminism. This view says dogmatically that women are greater than men. Women are greater than men. This is an extreme view of popular culture and society today. You see it on the news. You read of it in culture. It is an extremely liberal and, I believe, contra-biblical view on its face. I don't think I'd uh, encounter any argument from this congregation. Radical feminism. Men are less than women, or women are greater than men. Secondly, there's a second view called egalitarianism. Egalitarianism. Now, the second view says that women are equal to men little math lesson. We have math symbols for each of these views. They, this suggests that there is no difference whatsoever between a man and a woman. Women are equal to men, not only in essence, but also there is no legitimate distinction, distinction in the function of men and women in the church, let alone in society. This is also, candidly, a liberal view, and I believe it goes against the clear teaching of Scripture and should not be in the church. Let me put it this way. If egalitarianism was present in the Bible Fellowship Church, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be. Third, complementarianism. This is our view. It is the third, and it is the right view, if I could say so humbly, that women are equal in essence and dignity with men. However, there is a complementary image, uh, as image bearers of God, in a complementary fashion, men and women are different from one another. Men plus women equal the image-bearing nature of God. Men and women complement each other in God's good order creation design, particularly in the home and in the church. Again, my conviction is that only the complementarian position out of all these four views, truly and accurately reflects the Bible's teaching on this point. The fourth view is chauvinism. Chauvinism. 
I don't think we would ever dare have a problem with radical feminism in the church. But I'll tell you right now, I've seen chauvinism in the church. And there's no place for it. None at all. This fourth view is the equal opposite of radical feminism. And it says that women are inferior to men. Friends, this is also an extreme view. It is both absurd and patently abusive. It rejects God's good intentions for human flourishing and leads to all kinds of heartache and abuses in society and certainly in the church as well. Where do you stand? What is your view? To me, the Bible is absolutely clear in 1 Timothy 2.12. Paul paints a portrait of a godly woman adorned with good works, eager to grow in her love and knowledge of God's word, and who conducts herself appropriately in the church by not usurping the role or authority of the spiritual fathers in the church, that is, the elders. That means at the very least, at the very least, that she doesn't jump the fence into eldership in the church. But I think it also means quite clearly that a godly woman does not preach or teach over the gathered church. Others might disagree with me here, and I certainly understand and even respect them for it. But let me put it this way. When the church comes together, godly women quiet down. They listen up and they take note, just like godly men do who aren't elders. To be honest, to be completely honest, the big challenge today comes when we acknowledge the fact that there are all sorts of different contexts and classes and and opportunities found in the church today. Can a woman teach men in a co-ed Sunday school class? Can a woman lead a small group home Bible study? Can a woman teach in a special seminar on child abuse or sexual abuse in the local church? Again, the scenarios are literally endless. And Paul, perhaps the church in Ephesus, did not really have these categories to contend with. We do. And that's why we come into such conflict over this particular question. Not every elder, let alone every elder board, is going to agree on virtually every point of application. We're not going to line up the fence in all the same ways in every particular corner of the kingdom. And to me, that's okay. This is a family discussion. And God gives spiritually mature male elders to each local church. Let them watch the fence. Let them tend the fence. At the end of the day, though, let me be very, very clear. The thrust of Paul's point is that a woman, godly or otherwise, is prohibited from being an elder. Prohibited from being an elder. Which necessarily means that she is prohibited from teaching and preaching to men when the church is gathered. That is why here at Trinity, there are no regular ministry contexts where we permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. That is not to say, though, that I could not see some legitimate context or scenario or circumstance where an elder board could humbly and prayerfully decide that a certain need or an opportunity or some point for emphasis would not be most appropriately spoken to by one of the godly sisters of the church but it won't be a Sunday morning sermon. There's tension in this topic. I think we have to acknowledge the tension in the topic, but we also need to say without equivocating what Paul has very clearly said. To be clear, I think that that such a decision to let a woman teach even a special seminar in a mixed group because of conscience would be the great exception and not the norm. Clarity of one's understanding and charity with regards to the convictions of others is the only way to to robust gospel unity and freedom and a fruitful gospel ministry in and through the church. We got to close. And all God's people said, amen. I know, I know. But guess what? Guess what? It's my job to preach faithfully and I'm going to do it as long as it takes. We have one final point and only a brief moment to finish up. And uh, let's go right to it. The the final point, a godly woman will continue to persevere in faith by embracing her God-ordained responsibilities, which may, generally speaking, include having children and raising a family. 
Now, two things quickly need to be said as I close this morning. First, the reason for the Bible's prohibition in verse 12 is not situated in the past, in Ephesus. It is not cultural. Rather, it is anchored in creation. It is anchored in creation in keeping with God's good order of human relationships in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Note verse 13 and 14 of our text. For Adam, purpose clause, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Again, the biblical basis for biblical complementarianism and for prizing and appreciating and even respecting God's wise order between men and women in the home and church is rooted in Genesis 1 and 2. In other words, the church as the beginning of the new creation through Christ's atonement restores rather than reorients God's original designs for human flourishing. It's a return. God created Adam and Eve to fulfill a common purpose, and they were both equal and essential to fulfilling such a glorious purpose. However, God gave the man the responsibility to lead. And troublesome things happen when creatures ignore God's wise instructions. One author notes helpfully, in the original creation, God spoke his word to Adam, and then Adam spoke the word to Eve. And then they together were meant to rule over the beasts of the earth. But in the fall, notice the serpent spoke his word to Eve. And then Eve influenced Adam to follow her, and they both rebelled together against Almighty God. And the result, of course, was nothing short of death and devastation. Men and women are equal in value. Men and women are equal in dignity. Men and women are equal in importance in fulfilling God's good purposes in creation and in the kingdom of Christ. But they are not identical. They are not interchangeable. God has a purpose, a beautiful purpose for both. Their design from the start was perfect complementarity. The point here is not one of ability, like Adam was better than Eve, but rather it was one of responsibility. Adam was culpable, first and foremost. The reason why is in the wisdom of God, not in the carnal wisdom of culture. Verse 15, the last verse, simply says this, promising the hope of a God-honoring, flourishing if she holds fast to the Lord in faith, yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Again, there is no small debate on this proper understanding of verse 15, but the simplest answer here to me that Paul is that Paul uses childbearing as a figure of speech that uses one part of something to describe the whole of it. In other words, Paul's point is not that having babies is going to be a woman's saving grace. That is a misuse and abuse of this passage. But rather, because only Jesus Christ is one saving grace. Instead, like men, godly women will endure if they persevere in faith and flourish according to God's good design for their womanhood. Again, if she embraces her God-given role and responsibility as a wife and a mother and a helper, and a sister. Paul echoes what Paul says here in uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Or simply put, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, such faith produces love, holiness, and self-control. What do you see when you look at 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15? My hope is that you, after this message, that you do not see this text as brutish and as burdensome, but as truly beautiful. Ladies, my sincere hope is that today's message lifts you up to a place of right honor and importance and real beauty through belief and in the gospel and through embracing your God-assigned role as a mother and as a wife.
We want you to fly spiritually. We want you to flourish according to God's good instructions. But we warn you against jumping the fence. And against veering in to what God says the elders should do. Freedom amid fallenness requires respect of the boundaries that God has established for his glory and for our good. They aren't there to hinder us. They, aren't, they are there to help us, to protect us, and to promote true godliness among us. May it be so as we serve the Lord together. Let's pray. Father, you, uh, I, I trust, Lord, have been among us. I know you have. But I, I trust, Lord, that these words have honored you and they have, Lord, been a blessing. If these words, Lord, have been unduly heavy or burdensome upon anyone, I pray, O oh Lord, that you, would, that you would care for them and that they would come and talk to me or one of our elders. If they've been clarifying to some, I pray that they would also talk with us to, to maybe work out how they take the next steps of obedience within the body of Christ. Lord, help us to hold tightly to what you've said and not to add undue restrictions on it, to walk in freedom for we were saved for freedom, but Lord, to walk in holiness for we were made to be holy. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word and we pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen.